Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Good energy, good spirit. Glad to see everybody fellowshipping with each other. Uh, welcome to Grace Bible Church. If you are visiting with us, welcome. <laughs> um, we are so glad you're here. We've gl we're glad that you joined our family today. Uh, and if you're visiting and you haven't made it out to our Welcome Center yet, which is right out here but outside of our East Wing, we would love to have you stop by. And even, too, to take the little grace card that may be sitting right in front of you, fill that out and turn it in. They will have a gift ready to give to you as well. So we would love to hear about uh, the service and hear about um, just your connection here. We'd love to talk to you. Um, for those of our uh, regular church attenders, we do have a few announcements that we want to just make sure we put before you. Our first one is that our VBS, our Vacation Bible School, is coming up. Uh, I know it's June, um, but we're only a few months away, uh, and we've had a sign-up back there for a little while. Today is the last day to sign up if you would like to volunteer to help with our VBS. So um, to help serve in that ministry, we have a few different areas of service. We would encourage you to sign up for that. It's always such an exciting time. It's always a blessing to come together as a church family and serve in that capacity. Uh, and to see each other in a, in a new way and kind of to do this together. So we would encourage you to head to that table, sign up today, uh, because we have a few training meetings and things coming up that you will need to be aware of. So we would encourage you to do that. Uh, the other thing we want to make sure to let you know about is our special uh, ministry strategy meeting on April 21st. That is going to be after our PM service. So it's typically when we have a, a business meeting. This meeting is uh, we are really excited for. Uh, we want to let you know about some uh, things coming up, uh, different ways that we're going we're gonna to accomplish ministry here at Grace Bible Church. And this is a meeting uh, that we don't want you to kind of just slump off as like a regular business meeting, okay? Whether it's for our members or even if you just regularly attend but aren't a member, um, we'd like for you to know what's going on. So we'd encourage you to be there. Um, we're really excited to, to speak to you about it. So April 21st, after the PM service, we hope that you can be there uh, to talk about what we're doing here at Grace. Uh, that's all the announcements we really have for you. I encourage you to be checking your bulletins to know other things that are coming up. But to uh, begin our service formally, would you please turn with me to Psalm 45 this morning for our call to worship text. And when you have found Psalm 45, if you would stand as you're able to, out of respect for the word of God, and Brother Jacob DeVries is going to come and read this psalm for us. Psalm 45. To the choir master, according to the lilies, a mascal of the sons of Korah, a love song. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips, therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the hearts of the king's enemies. The people fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and acacia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Let your people in your father's house, or forget your people in your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes, she is led to the king with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever. 
endeavor. You may be seated. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. You tell us that this is a day that you have made to rejoice and be glad in it, which is easy on a morning like this when we get up, sun shining, temperatures are warmer. It's easy to glorify you and thank you for this day, Lord, but help us to also remember you on the gray, gloomy days when it's not so nice and we get up and maybe not necessarily thankful for the weather. It's still a day that you have made, so help us to rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> Lord, I pray for our country. Pray for the direction it's going in. Uh, as it is an election year, there'll be a lot of politics this summer. Um, a lot of people are not happy with the way it's going. Um, maybe not happy with our leadership. Lord, if we have a problem with it, help us turn to Romans 13 and to read it and see what you say about it. Even though we may not be happy with it, you say to honor those that are in positions of authority because you have put them there. How can we argue with that? Um, so let us be respectful of those that are in uh, charge of our country. Um, that is hard to do, but give us the strength to do that and display godly character in all that we do. <clears throat> Pray you'll help give us ears to hear today. Help us remember what we uh, have um, heard. We ask that you use Pastor Kyle to speak to us. Uh, we thank you for him, for blessing our church, to follow him after Pastor Fisher. You have given us just a great pastor in Pastor Kyle. We thank you so much. Um, if there's any here today, Lord, that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, would you work in that or those hearts? Draw them unto yourself and lead them to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we approach our time of worship this morning, it's always wonderful to start with adoring who we are here to worship. So if you would stand with me, and we're going to sing, sing praise to God who reigns above the God of all creation. Sing praise to God. Psalm 80, 1 through 3. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. 
you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. For Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So many of us, as we approach the throne of God, realize we've strayed. We've, we've gone off on our own path. We're so thankful for a shepherd who in his power and his might can come lead us and can come save us. Let's ask him to restore our hearts this morning and affirm together that he is our all in all. Would you sing with me? Our men can come forward now for our time of worship and giving. We are so thankful for our church family joining today, assembling today. If you are visiting with us this morning, we're so thankful that you have chosen to be with us. We are excited about what the Lord will do in us so that he may multiply glory through us and with us. Would you pray with me now? Father, I, I always give thanks for my church constantly and constantly mention them in prayer. Remembering them before you our Father, for their faith and their labors of love, I ask that you would strengthen our faith, you would grow us in the faith of the gospel that grows us in oneness and in service to you. I ask that you would increase our labors of love. You would cause our service to you and to one another to be consistent, to be passionate, to image Christ and reflect the heart and person of Christ. I am thankful for the steadfastness of our congregation and I pray that it would continue. Steadfastness pertaining to the scriptures On Christ, the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And so increase our steadfastness 
in the Savior presented to us in the Scriptures. Help us to stand on the rock that is the Word and help us to stand on the rock that is your Son, the sure foundation of the Scriptures and the rock that is Christ. I ask this morning that we would know the love of the brothers, the love of the sisters, spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, spiritual children, as we are the family of God, to represent the family of God, a local family. Would you cause us to be spiritually active and present in the lives of one another? For you have chosen us. And the gospel came to us not only in word but in power and through the Holy Spirit with full conviction. I pray that this morning the word would be given with power and with full conviction. And it would be received with obedience and full submission. I pray that as you prepare us for the table, that our hearts would be pure. Father, I ask if there are improper motives represented here, and no doubt there are. Improper motives are so present and so threatening in all of our hearts. I ask that you would reveal that to the individual, that they would see through the mirror of your word where they are insufficient. I ask for readiness of mind as the word is preached so that as we listen and prepare for Lord's table, we would, we would have a, an aptitude to what you're teaching us through the scriptures so that we're quick to confess if necessary, ready to repent. I ask that you would strengthen the hurting, the discouraged, the sick, the troubled in our congregation, knowing that your word is sufficient to accomplish this. May this, t this time be one of praise, undistracted praise, and preparation for your service, and we ask this through Christ. Amen.
to Nehemiah chapter 9. You'll have to bear with me. In my mind, Patrick was supposed to be leading this morning. And so bear with me with these names. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 5. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabnia, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. As these men stood before their brothers and sisters and said, Let's bless the Lord. Would you stand with me and bless the Lord who has blessed us with so many blessings? As the table is laid out before us, I hope we are thinking of the greatest blessing that we have received. The blood of Jesus shed for us, and the body of Jesus given for us. Isaiah 42, 5 and 6. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Let's ask our God, Spirit, to give us strength this morning, to understand the scriptures, to be illumined to it, and to cause us 
to continue to live strengthened in the calling that he has given to us. Let's sing Holy Spirit, living breath of God this morning. Thank you for your wonderful singing this morning. You may have a seat. At this time, we'll dismiss those second grade and down out for Children's Church this morning. First Samuel 18 this morning. First Samuel 18. I'm not sure how many of you, I know some of you, I'm not sure how many of you read ahead in our sermon series. If you're visiting with us this morning, we've been studying through 1 Samuel, just taking it passage by passage. If you've read ahead, you know that there is some adult content in today's passage. The Old Testament could be described as an ocean floor littered with oysters, which at first glance may not seem all that pretty. There are certainly some beautiful passages in the Old Testament, some beautiful reefs and perhaps some beautiful wildlife, but every once in a while we find an oyster that looks pretty ugly. At first glance you wouldn't say there's much to this. In fact, you might just discard it, maybe in your Bible reading plan. But if you do the work with an oyster and you do all the jagged hammering and prying, you may just find that there's some beauty inside. And this morning, this morning we have a text that may not seem all that pretty, but once you do the work, you find that there is a beautiful pearl some beautiful truth and necessary theology. For Samuel 18 immediately follows the primary the primary narrative which draws the the lens of the the story or the the the, the flow of the book on David. So up until this point the, the lens has been 
on Samuel, and then it's been on Saul, and chapter 17 brings David primarily into focus. And of course, you know, chapter 17 is the, the passage we all know so well, David and Goliath, which of course we talked about last week. And following 1 Samuel 17 into really the conclusion of the book, it's the, the, the story of the book is going to be David on the rise and Saul on the descent. And we note that not only in Saul's, the state of Saul's kingdom, but primarily and even more so the state of Saul's character. And we begin to see Saul's character truly degenerate here in this chapter and we'll continue to see it throughout the book. And so we have some difficult a difficult road ahead of us, some difficult work ahead of us. There is the possibility that some some questions will arise on the way home today uh, in maybe the life of your teenager or your older child, and that's okay. I hope you take that opportunity to discuss these things. But there are actually several challenges with today's chapter, and there might be a challenge you don't even know about in the first part of the chapter and I do think it's very important to bring you into that challenge and address some of the issues that are there. So having said all this, knowing that we have some work to pry open the oyster, let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to look at your word. We're thankful for the glory that is in it. And I pray that you would reveal to us yourself in the passage. You would help us to see your grace, your holiness, your compassion, your wisdom. And I pray that you'd help us to, in seeing you, then look in. That we might view our own unholiness, our insufficiency, the deficiencies in our character, the ways that we are not like Jesus. I pray that you'd help me to walk through these verses helpfully, theologically, faithfully, and practically. And I pray that you would impress upon the listener their need for this text and what you have for them as a result of it. And I ask these things through Jesus. Amen. Well, if you've been with us and you're our church family, if you're a visitor who's been here for a while, a guest who's been here consistently, you will know that we've, we've kind of seen Saul begin to just unravel a little bit. And it's like in, in chapter 18, he's, he's full-fledged kind of lost it. And, and we're going to see some of those things. But as I mentioned, the, the, the overall structure or strategy with Saul at this point is just that he would decrease and that David would increase. And this is something that we see in the first part, what we see through all, all throughout this, this chapter. But I want to look in first of, verse, first of all, in verses 1 through 15, at the mean green monarch. All right, the mean green monarch. And I'll explain to you why specifically I've used this terminology. It's not just to be creative, but there actually is some specific terminology here. And I want you to note the first uh, kind of movement of the passage is immediately following David and Goliath, Jonathan in the court of Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, who we were introduced to already uh, back in chapter 15 to 16 primarily, he's immediately impressed with the person of David, so much so that he initiates a relationship with him. And I want you to see not just verses 1 through 5, but I'll show you kind of how it fits within the whole of the unit. But if you read with me verses 1 through 5, just follow along as I read. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, that's David, and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. So that Saul set him over the men of war. 
And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So you note the first thing, the first movement of this text is the relationship between David and Jonathan and then David's growing popularity. It's almost like everything David touches turns to gold and you'll see that constantly in the coming chapters. But I want to note this relationship between David and Jonathan and I want to note it for several reasons. One, we'll get to this, just how sweet the relationship is. We'll talk about briefly some aspects of biblical friendship. But this is kind of the first, the first prying in the ugliness that we have to do. And you may not even realize this, but I did think it was important to go down this road because this passage is commonly used and commonly perverted, actually. The relationship between David and Jonathan is the primary go-to text, is one of the primary go-to texts for those who would argue that there is permissible homosexuality in the Bible. You may not have heard this, but I did think it was important for, for us to, to talk through this, not only for you as parents or potential grandparents, but because I wanted you to hear me and some of our teenagers to hear me talk through this. And I think the terminology here is very important to work with. If you were wanting a loaded gun for why you think homosexuality is okay or there are relationships in the Bible that seem to be permissive, permitting same-sex relationships, this passage has some interesting terminology, and some of that terminology is just in how we hear it. And so that's kind of what I, wanted, what I wanted to talk through. So culturally, there is a movement within Christianity that has a number of terms, but I'm going to call it what I think is probably the most uh, clarifying uh, label, which is called the homosexual hermeneutic. And if you understand what hermeneutics is, it's the interpretation of the Bible. And so the homosexual hermeneutic attempts to find passages that explain why homosexuality is okay and why same-sex relationships are permissible. And this is primarily, this is one of their primary go-to passages. And I want to walk through this terminology with you. The covenant here, he made a covenant with him. This is not to be understood as some sort of um, deeply affectionate or intimate relationship. This sort of covenant we, we see later in the book that that David protects Jonathan's family. And so it was probably a covenant of relationship pertaining to their protection of one another. It was a part of the promise they made uh, under the umbrella of their friendship with one another. Uh, da Jonathan's initial relationship with David, yes, it is close, and they re they're referred to as loving friends, but actually what you see most of all from Jonathan here is our political moves. And you may not necessarily see that unless you press into the terminology. The giving of the robe is Jonathan's acknowledgement that this is the Lord's anointed. Essentially what Jonathan is doing is he's, he is recognizing that David is God's man. And so the giving of the robe is the bestowal of respect recognizing who this man is which is the same reason that he gives him, or one of the same reasons that he provides him with armor. Remember, he doesn't, David doesn't have this. We find this in chapter 16. He's essentially just trying to help his friend, and he is establishing a relationship with the Lord's anointed, that, the man that Jonathan perceives to be the king. We see the, this idea of the removal of the robe in the New Testament. Do you remember when the the, the, the son returns after his journey in the far off country in Luke 15. What does the father do when he gets back? He removes his robe and gives it to him. It's a sign of bestowing status onto his son. And so this should not be read with any sort of inappropriate double entendre. It's the bestowal of status. The love here is referring to the depth of their friendship. This word is used elsewhere in the Old Testament, 2 Kings, I believe it's chapter 8, I could be wrong on that, I know it's in 2 Kings, to refer to a general admiration for someone. There was a king who had a love for David, a general admiration for David. And we have to remember, perhaps the, the, most, the, the, the most convincing response to the idea that there could be some sort of inappropriate relationship here is just, it's what's not said. 
you have to remember that when the writer is writing this, he is not writing with any category for permissible homosexuality. This idea that there could be something here between David and Jonathan that is inappropriate would have been absolutely foreign to the writer of this book because he submitted to the Old Testament laws which makes plain God's feeling on what appropriate marriage is, true marriage is between a man and a woman. To suggest a homosexual relationship is to import ideas into this passage that couldn't be farther from the heart of the scriptures. You say, so what is here? It's simply the idea, and beautifully the idea, of a deep and meaningful friendship. A lasting, close-knit friendship. A friendship that perhaps many of you have enjoyed in your life. You know there are people that you can be friends with, and there are people that you have to be friends with. That as you grow deeper into your relationship with this person, you just recognize, and, and it's almost hard to find, and, and I'm going to read a few passages of scripture that make this idea clear, that it truly is hard to find. That there are friends that as you connect with them, you just know there's something deeper there. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Maybe some of you have had a brother, maybe a younger brother, and you say amen to this. The idea is a comparison that there are friends who are so loyal to you that they're actually better relationships than the problems that can come in family. Proverbs 18, 24, many people apply this to Christ, and I really think that's an inappropriate application. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So the idea of Proverbs 18.24 is that quality of friends is superior to quantity of friends. A man of many friends is closer to destruction than he realizes. But there is a friend. Find that friend who is with you through thick and thin. They stick closer even sometimes than family does. And it's this kind of friendship written by, by David's son Solomon that I think that we see on full display in the life of David himself. We certainly see David's family begin to become chaotic. But his friendship with Jonathan was always certain. It was a life source that he had. And may I encourage you, loved one, that once you find that friend, that unique connection, C.S. Lewis says of friendship, friendship is birthed the moment two people mutually say, you too? The idea that there's just two people that they connect. And that is a sweet and precious gift given to us by God. Pursue these friendships. And, and young people, can I speak to you for just a moment? In, in a world where you can jump on your phone and be followed by thousands of people. Or have Facebook. And I know young people, Facebook's for the old people. But if you have Facebook and you have all these friends, and you might have relationships with two of them, don't buy the lie that quantity of relationships equals quality of relationships. Those of us who've lived just a little bit more life than you know it is the exact opposite. Find a friend who sticks closer to the brother that your soul loves and their soul loves you. So this is the first difficulty that we have in the text. Perhaps you didn't even know it was one, but I think it was worth mentioning. So what does this have to do with the mean green monarch? Well, this passage fits within the context of the larger whole. It's a movement within a whole story. And just very briefly, if you see that this passage really serves to initiate the conflict 
of, of Saul's feelings towards David. If you look at the whole flow of the passage, it begins with a relationship with one of Saul's children, and the passage ends with a relationship with, with one of Saul's children. Jonathan's, or Saul's son, Jonathan, and his daughter, Michal. And sandwiched in between this relationship between two of Saul's children are Saul's feelings toward David. And this is where we get the idea of his meanness and his greenness. Why is he beginning to feel envious? Well, note verse 5, that after, after the relationship is initiated with his son, after his own son, that Saul is beginning to feel threatened by David and Jonathan, his own son, begins a, a true friendship with David. It leads into jealousy. Why? Because everything David does succeeds. Verse 5. And then they're remembered, they remember the people of Israel, specifically the women in verse 7, remember David's victory over Goliath. And they literally begin to sing David's praises. Saul has struck down his thousands and David is ten thousands. And Saul begins to grow in envy. Verse 8, and Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what, listen, what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul sees the writing on the wall. The people are turning, to put it very pettily, they like him more than they like me. And it begins to bother him. And I love verse 9. Saul eyed David from that time on. Wherever David was around, Saul gave him the side eye. This is someone we've got to keep our eye on. This is a problem. He viewed him as a threat. And so this envy then turns to outright meanness. It turns to violence. Verse 10, the next day a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. Remember, David would come to play music to, to, to calm Saul when he was in these fits that, that the harmful spirit caused, except that it got out of control. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. So now Saul's envy turns to outright malicious anger, and he attempts to take Saul's li David's life. Have you ever wanted someone to fail so that you could be elevated? What an immensely sinful thing to want your success at the expense of another's failure. Do you feel threatened by someone so much so that you wouldn't admit it, but you kind of hope they mess up in some way? so that other people will compare your successes. This is the envy that begins to control Saul, and it turns to outright bitter violence. I had a friend in college, I've mentioned him before, I believe I mentioned him on a Wednesday once, I had a friend in college. <laughs> Ironically, his name is David. And truly, everything he touched turned to gold. I mean, he was just one of those people. David was a computer science minor and beat out two MIT grads to work for a tech job in the government. He was just good at everything. He's, he is good at everything to this day. I would come from class, lay, I would come from a class or a study period laboring over Greek. Greek was my kryptonite, man. Just killing myself to scratch out grades. And he would show up with the study book closed on the table, not having cracked it, and ace everything. And I wanted to punch him. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you like this? And we ended up dear friends. We're, we're still dear friends. He was in my wedding. And... But had I begin to truly walk in the flesh... There's a part of me that would have really resented him. But if we walk in the spirit, God gives us the strength to rejoice when others rejoice. 
and be there to celebrate their successes and cheer on their spiritual or life victories. Don't needlessly and foolishly in the flesh compare yourselves in your life. Comparison truly is, as it's been said, the enemy of our joy. And certainly we see that it turns to chaos in the life of Saul. And it leads in his life and actually in the life of his family and in his kingdom. Actually, I, I do want to note before we go to the next passage. Where does anger and envy lead you? Saul was afraid of David. What happens when we live in anger and bitterness and envy? We begin to operate out of fear. We only have so many bad modes of operation. And we begin to live out of them all if jealousy is fueling us. So, as we said, this conflict begins to grow because David's success begins to grow. Saul removed him from his presence. Saul says, get out of here. I'm going to find you something to do. And ironically, he put, him in char- he put him in front of the people. He got him out of the court and out where more people can see him. Look at verse, 14, or, uh, verse 13. So Saul made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. So now the people are watching David, the people of Israel. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. Everyone just loves David. David's the man. Saul's not the man anymore. Look at this guy, David. And so Saul, in his reaction, attempting to minimize David does the exact opposite by putting him in front of the people. And I want you to see, secondly with me, as this tension begins to rise, a kingly conflict, a kingly conflict. Verse 17, then Saul said to David, here is my elder daughter Merab, I will give her to you as a wife. Now why is Saul doing this? You say, this does not seem like a very you know, generous thing. Saul is not in a particularly generous mood right now. Or well, remember what he had said would happen to those who killed Goliath, that he would be given one of the daughters. And so Saul's like, I've got to make good on my promise. And so he says, here's Merab. I will give her to you, this is verse 17, for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him. Let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So what's he trying to do? He's saying, you can have my daughter, but you have to earn her. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. You have to earn her. And David said to Saul, who am I? And who are my relatives and my father's clan that I should be son-in-law to the king? So there's this humble response by David. And there's actually a pragmatic response that we'll see more clearly later. And that's essentially that David doesn't have the money to purchase the wife of a king. And so Saul takes advantage of this, verse 19, and actually gives Merab to somebody else. He reneges on his promise. But Saul has another problem. A problem that many fathers of young ladies may have already encountered or will encounter. And that's when you begin to see your daughter flutter her eyelashes at a young man. Verse 20, now Saul's daughter, Michal, loved. David. Uh oh. Jonathan is already in a close friendship with Saul's rival, and now his daughter is getting a crush on the rival. But Saul still has to fulfill his promise. And falling into his characteristic pragmatism, what Saul does here is says, all right, you don't have the money to pay the bride price. So here's what you can do. You can go and you can kill some Philistines for me. Look at verse 21. Saul thought, let me give her to him that she may be a snare for him. He's plotting. Why? Because he's envious and fearful and hatred. And the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul pragmatically plots to get David taken care of, but he doesn't want to have to be the one to do it. So he's trying to come up with this plan to get David killed. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants to speak. Speak to David in private and say, behold, the king has delight in you. 
I'm sure that he wanted the servants to say this so he didn't have to say it himself. <laughs> like, I'm not telling him I like that guy. He has delight in you, and the king and all his servants love you. Now then become the king's son-in-law. So David, so Saul says, go, go to the servants, or Saul goes to the servants and says, All right, look, tell David I really want him to be my son-in-law. Now, why would the servants have to persuade David of this? I mean, Saul did just throw a spear at him. Doesn't seem like David's in good favor. So Saul says, we got to persuade him, right? Why? Because Saul's trying to get him killed. Verse 23. So Saul's servants spoke these words in the ears of David. And David said, does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law? Again, such a humble, sincere response. I'm a poor man of no reputation. The servants of Saul told him, thus and so did David speak. Then Saul said, thus shall you say to David, the king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. As the believers, what we tend to do is operate in the control of the spirit. But Saul, under the harmful spirit, begins to plot and manipulate. So we note that Saul's plot is to manipulate a circumstance where David is killed. David, acknowledging his plight, that he is unable to pay because he lacks resource to pay the bride price of the king, says, I can't afford your daughters. I can't marry your daughters. You say, what in the world is going on with this bride price? Well, that's what we note in verse 25, an agreed upon price. This leads to a cultural aspect of the text, this idea of bride price. You see that in verse 25. A bride price was a cost agreed, agreed upon by the father and by the fiance of a master or an enslaved bride in order to redeem that bride into the new family. So if, if I wanted to, let's say, you know, let's say you or I, you know, loved a, a young lady at this time in history, we had to go to the father and we had to negotiate what, what the father and we considered to be a fair price. And then we could purchase that bride out of family and into our family. And this is not the idea of like it's not a mere transaction, treating the, the lady as property. It's actually a family transaction. We're purchasing into family, and that requires a price. This bride price, if you want to summarize it this way, maintains, maintains two aspects, purchase and possession. The concept is found in Genesis 34, where Shechem agrees to a price for Dinah, and the law is laid down regarding the bride price in Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy 22, where this aspect is, de or this, this concept is defined and clarified. The bride price is an agreed upon price paid by the fiance to the father to purchase into family. And now we get to the ugly oyster. What was the bride price? Gold and silver? No, that's what David didn't have. Remember what Saul's doing. If I can plot, if I can get David around too many Philistines than he can handle, then they'll kill him, and it won't be my problem anymore. So what does he say? Give me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Now remember at this time, the, the primary religious, or the primary physical purification mark of the people of Israel is that they were circumcised. Remember, up until this point, even... Even Saul and David have referred to the Philistines as the uncircumcised, and they do it almost backhanded. David does in chapter 17, the uncircumcised Philistine. One writer says about passages like this that we shouldn't be afraid to wade into what's called the nasty narratives of the Old Testament. For it's in the nasty stuff you'll find God's scary holiness. And incredible grace. So the bride price is that David go kill a hundred Philistines, collect the foreskins, and bring them back. Obviously, Saul is intending that David be killed. One man against a hundred, surely he can't make it out alive. Now, I don't want to be grossly comical beyond what is already gross in the passage, but I do think it's crazy that David gets two hundred. 
He's like, forget 100, man. Watch this. And he kills 200. And what's the point of the passage? David can't be stopped. Why? Because he's God's man. He's going to thwart these plots. Verse, <clears throat> verse 26. And when, se- when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time it expired, David arose and went along with his men and killed 200 of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter, Michal, for a wife. And you have to know, Saul's like, oh, come on. This didn't work. But when Saul, when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. You say, so what is going on? Here, Well, just to wrap up the narrative, I want you to see in verses 26 to 30, the resolution of redemption, the resolution of redemption. And the first thing that we see pertaining to this redemption is the ratified transaction. What was the agreed upon price? 104 skins. What did David do? He delivered that and more. And so what took place? The price was met beyond the price was actually met. This brutal, ugly price that was given was paid. And then you note in verses 28 through 30 with me, this rising tension. Saul was even more afraid. And then the passage concludes, verse 30, Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. What we see in this passage is essentially the the insufficiency or the deficiency of one king. As he grows insecure and envious and another is on the rise, God's man, the man after God's own heart, God's appointed man. But if we see both of these kings within the whole of the story of God, we actually see both of their deficiencies. So yes, David was successful in this text to purchase the bride. To redeem her into family, to meet the agreement, to go above and beyond to pay the price. But as the story of David will unfold, we'll begin to see his deficiency and his insufficiency and his failures. And what we note in the 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 failure of Saul in this text, and the coming failure of David, who seems like the man, who seems like the guy, the one that has to be the, 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 the primary hero of Israel, is that God is setting up something all along, and David would not fulfill the ultimate plan of God. And in order to fulfill the ultimate plan of God, God required two things, an ugly price for a beautiful possession. In this text, it's a pretty ugly price, isn't it? To obtain a pretty beautiful possession. The bride that he loved. Redemption means, redemption by the means of brutality in order to gain beauty. In order to purchase this bride. And what we know within the fullness of God's plan is that the son of David so many times over would brutally go above and beyond to pay the price to purchase his bride. That he would, Ephesians 5, love her and give himself for her. So what is necessary, this passage hints at, and what's necessary within the full of God's plan is an ugly price for a beautiful possession, and secondly, a successful king in a long line of failures. David succeeds here in the gaining of a daughter and purchasing her into family. But even in the next few chapters, we're going to see David begin to be fearful. 
David, the mighty one, is going to be afraid. And of course, you know he's going to fail morally. It's easy for us to point out the failures of Saul. But as we begin to see the failures of David, we begin to ask the questions, who's the king that's not going to fail? The fairest of men, Psalm 45, will establish his throne once and for all. And what we will find together in Revelation 19 through 21 is that at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the groom will once and finally receive his bride in order to be crowned and establish the new heavens and new earth forever. Truly, in this passage, we get just a little glimpse of the beauty that God intends from brutality. And when we see it in his fullness, we see the risen, we see the lamb lifted up to die and the beauty that would come from that brutality and the risen lamb who would conquer death and the lamb once and for all who will receive his bride to purchase it into family and establish his kingdom. This passage within the whole of the scriptures teaches us that Jesus is the redeemer king who's sufficient to pay for our lives and worthy to rule our lives. He is the redeemer king who ultimately will purchase the bride and it will be through ugly means. And that king, that redeemer king who purchases is worthy, who attains the possession, is worthy of our absolute honor and submission. And since he is our redeemer, we must serve him in love and appreciation, not obligation and minimized responsibility as Christian robots, just doing what Christian robots do, but living out our love relationship with and to our Redeemer. And since he is our King, we must serve him in honor and loyalty. Of what room in your heart do you ref- what room in your heart do you refuse to give the key because Jesus is the king who rules all of us yet we like to keep enough hidden for us enough that we think belongs to us and there's a there, there's a room and in that room there's a chair and we think we can reign that throne And what unsubmitted aspects of your heart and life are you usurping the reign of your Redeemer King? He will have it all in the end, loved one. And so let us now submit to him that we may live in love and joy and honor for the King who paid sufficiently for the purchase and possession of his people. Would you pray with me? Father, we are thankful for this time. We are thankful for your great love. I ask that you would cause us to know more of that love now. We thank you for the sufficiency of Christ, and we ask through him. Amen. Our men are going to come forward now for our time as we receive the Lord's table. If you're visiting with us today, we are so thankful that you've joined us. Just one quick note, on, or a few quick notes actually, on the Lord's table. We believe the Lord's table to be the right and privilege of True believers, that is those who have professed their faith in Christ alone. They have called out for forgiveness of their sins on the basis of the shed blood and broken body of Christ. 
And so if you're visiting with us this morning and you're uncertain of your relationship with Christ, of where you stand before the Father through Christ, you're not sure if you're saved, then I would encourage you to allow the elements to pass you by. We are, we allow, we open Lord's table to true believers in Christ. That is those who are trusting by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone, the shed blood of Christ and broken body of Christ for salvation. And so if you're in good standing before the Lord, that is there's no unconfessed, unrepentant, hidden sin in your life, then of course you are free to receive the table. As the piano plays quietly, I would encourage you to have a time of confession before the Lord before you receive the elements. Remember that this is 
an ordinance intending to remember. Remembering specifically His death until He comes. We said this morning that to purchase redemption, the bride, a payment was necessary. In our text this morning, that payment was fairly brutal, but in comparison, the sufferings that Jesus would receive in his body, it is a minuscule narrative. That Jesus would take redemption in his flesh by the suffering in his flesh. And this is what the Apostle Paul received from the Lord. Delivered to him on the night which he was betrayed. This is my body broken. And though it's not imaged for us with the resources that we use, the bread that we use. As the body is broken, so we are to imagine Christ's body being broken. Yet not the bones in order to keep the scriptures, to fulfill the scriptures. The flesh being torn. The person of Christ experiencing physical tearing. In order to absorb the wrath of God into his body. The body broken for you. And so we as individuals remember it was broken for me. And we as a body. The body of Christ. Remember that it was broken for us to secure the oneness and glory of the church, his body. The broken body of Christ means the unified body, the church. And so, take, eat, this is my body. Do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. A body bleeds. And again, the brutality of the bride price this morning has no comparison to the brutality of the bleeding body of Christ sufficient to pay for the bride. John tells us that he heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude and like the roar of many waters and the sound of many peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The marriage of who? The Lamb. And what in the Old Testament would cause the angel of death to pass over the blood of the lamb and what in the new testament causes our eternal condemnation to be put at bay the blood of the lamb who will one day the lamb himself because of the full purchase acquire absolute possession of his bride this is my blood the new covenant Do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Loved ones, we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? And so let us express our gratitude to Christ together. Would you stand with me as we sing, Jesus, thank you.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time. We're thankful for your people that you purchased by your son's blood, that you cause us to live out who we are in Christ today. Bring us back faithfully and safe, safely together tonight. And we ask these things through Christ. Amen. You're dismissed.